de Gras. Um, so, <laughs> uh, we're moving on to Sir Philip Sidney today, and uh, moving from the early Christian discussion of uh, poetics into the Renaissance, and we concluded with Dante and so forth, so it is Italian Renaissance. But in Sir Philip Sidney, uh, we are dealing with a Puritan poet, uh, with Puritan poetics. And so um, I think there's uh, an interesting um, contrast. I'm not going to make the contrast, but that could be drawn between Dante's view of what poetics is doing and what Sidney's is, whether there's a Catholic poetics and a Protestant poetics, uh, that's a big issue and I don't deal with it on this course. I'm not even sure exactly that there is, although Dante's epic is very different from Milton's. Uh, but it, uh, Sidney himself is an interesting fellow. He dies at 32, which is uh, extraordinary. Um, he was the prototypical Renaissance man. So he was a soldier. He was uh, a courtier. So he was in the realms of uh, the court of uh, Elizabeth at the time. Also a poet and died in battle. And that it prompted one of the largest funerals uh, ever in English history. So he was a famous fellow even his own day. And as I say, dies at the age of 32, which is sort of interesting. <coughs> he does write certain uh, poems that are passed on to memory, like Arcadia, which is a brilliant poem and, uh, and should be read, though I don't do it on my courses, or at least not yet. Uh, but it's this work that we're looking at today, his defense of poetry, which, or defense of poesy, which, uh, for which he's most famous. So it's a critical work. And it's largely because he, a he a answers uh, one question which is of great interest to me and on this course, which is uh, why should poetry matter to a Christian culture? Why should it matter in a university, a Christian liberal arts university even? Why should we bother with poetry? I know. Uh, people who are involved even in uh, the Christian intellectual world and apologetics who totally ignore poetry. In fact, will say they've, they've read no literature. They've, they've read some history. They read, tend to read a great deal of philosophy. They'll read um, theological works, but they won't touch literature. They have no knowledge of it. And it's in part because of a lack of time. But they'll almost boast of the fact that they are ignorant of that. They'll know pop culture, but they'll, they won't have read any poetry. So Sidney seems to be addressing uh, that very issue. Why should it matter? Uh, and I think that his uh, answer is, is good and it's profound and helpful. So that's why he's on the course. Um, because the, in the, the backdrop here, as a Puritan, the case being made against it's quite strong, which is that some think that it ought to be wholly removed, or is he? puts it, scourged out of the church of God. Because uh, in terms of, of plays and so forth, this is a bit of a, the backdrop for Shakespearean theater even, there are the Puritans that want the theaters to be closed because of the immorality being depicted. And remember, people have a view of, the, of art at this point, and everyone has this view that art does teach. It, it isn't only entertainment. Instruction is going on, and matters on the stage are often lewd and uh, depraved, and are people, by example of those on stage, not being corrupted in the process? And the Puritans will say, some of them at any rate, will say yes. And furthermore, what goes on around the theaters is problematic. So they become places where people will go to meet in public, and of course then uh, people who uh, like to offer themselves to people in public are gathering as well. In other words, prostitutes gather around the theaters. And with that, uh, children outside of wedlock uh, are arising. So social, very social ills. So they're going to close the theaters for that reason. It, it's almost the backdrop of measure for measure. The body houses and so forth and the, the, the iniquity 
So uh, along with the license of the poet comes licentiousness. Uh, so that's the immediate backdrop. Um, and it's, it's said more or less, not exactly verbatim, but the critique that Plato made of the poets that they always lie and they can only lie, it's a form of deception, is really there. And he is addressing that because there's a renewed <coughs> concern for moral integrity. Remember, this is um, not that long after the Reformation. So Sidney's writing between uh, 1554 and 1586. And um, this is a few decades after the Reformation, which is about a Reformation of uh, theological doctrine, but also purity of life. And the Puritans are particularly zealous for that, living holy lives. So that's, and, and he's one of them. He's accounted a Puritan. So how does he then justify poetry? Because it would be interesting and uh, not usually expected that someone who is a Puritan would also uh, want to uh, value or promote poetry as something that ought to be valued and promoted furthermore. So he begins, and uh, let me say something about this. But, and he, he's also, he's not interested in uh, technical rules of, of uh, poetry or poetics. So he's not, uh, it's, it's broad brush stuff. He's not taking an Aristotelian position. By the way, he's born at Penshurst. I should say that because um, this becomes uh, he's a he's Sir Philip Sidney. He's an aristocrat, eldest son of Sir Henry Sidney and Mary Dudley, um, and she's the daughter of the Duke of Northampton, a very important duke in the uh, English aristocracy. So. Um, and his godfather was Philip II of Spain, who was a great enemy of the English people. So he's got strong aristocratic uh, roots and also some Catholic ones furthermore, but he's not one. He is most decidedly a Puritan, but he's, he's writing from the perspective of an ar aristocratic uh, vantage. And uh, furthermore, he is admired. This man is famous not only in England, but on the continent. So he is a man that would be widely recognized and admired as a poet when he writes here, uh, a favorite of Queen Elizabeth herself. So Im important figure, as I say, dies at 32. When he dies, there is a state funeral and it is just packed because he's a sort of a rock star. Um, but he, uh, he argues that, um, and it, it deals with three major topics. Your, your intro talks about this in this uh, Norton anthology, and it's good on this front. He says that it deals with the d dignity of poetry. So that w one of the three main emphasis, the dignity of poetry. And he puts that alongside uh, philosophy and history. It's very common in Christian universities to uh, get people to see the um, necessity of philosophy. Apologetics is, root, as I say, most apologists study philosophy. That's how they become apologists. That's what they do. They deal with, you know, rational defenses of the faith. So that's e an easy case, relatively. Um, history, likewise. This is the venue of God's providence. Uh, studying church history, the church people who are going to operate in the church need to have a sense of where they stand in relation to past generations. If you're a Baptist, what did your Baptist forebears do? If you're a Presbyterian, the reformers in that realm, if you're Anglican, whatever. Or if you're a Catholic or whatever, you will have what did the, or your forebears say. So church history is an obvious one. Poetry doesn't find quite the same natural um, defenders in the Christian world. Um, so that, he speaks on that, and so we'll, I'll, I'll come to that, and that's the main thrust here, the, the dignity of poetry, and how he argues even how it is superior to history and philosophy, which I agree to, I happen to hold myself. Uh, secondly, he uh, deals with the specific objections to poetry by his uh, imagined opponents, or not imagined, because he's responding to another writer. 
in this. Uh, and thirdly, and specifically the charge that poetry is lying and poetry, poets are liars. And thirdly, he comments on the current state of English literature. And so he talks about contemporary poetics. And that part I'm going to take less interest in. That would be of more interest if we were doing a course in the 16th century uh, here. Here it's lit theory and it's being considered historically and in the thematically, theoretically. So we'll, we'll look at the first two points more than, uh, than the third one. But uh, so he wants to defend poetry and its specific um, why it m should matter to a Christian culture and by implication why it should matter to not just you but the church today. How many of you had poetry readings in your churches ever? I have, but it's been rare and that's not, um, that itself is maybe a reflection of the state of poetry in our day rather than anything else. But um, still, the value of it is there a felt need. Where are the Christian poets? Where are the Christian writers? May, we ought to really prioritize good Christian poetry or good Christian writing. Uh, you don't hear much of that. So he notes, first of all, to make his defense, and he is uh, responding here uh, to a work, um, and it's there in the, in the footnote, but he wants to make the point, and he notes that poetry is the earliest kind of writing in many cultures. It's the very earliest type of writing. And this will be a case that's made uh, repeatedly, not just by Sydney, it will be repeated, and the emphasis will be even stronger come the Enlightenment. And there they'll do something different with it. They'll say that there was an age of poetry followed by an age of philosophy, followed by an age of theology, and finally by an age of science, the four ages. And so, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley will respond to that, the four ages of poesy. He's responding to that, but at that point, it began as poetry and then there was a critique from the philosophers that, that attacked poetry and basically got rid of the necessity of it. And then we came to a theological age and then we learned better and then the sciences replaced it all. So we just need a new science now. And uh, Shelley's gonna argue for the necessity of poetry. Uh, that's not what Sidney is doing here. He's simply noting that it is there in the earliest beginnings and it will be across cultures. And I don't think there's much doubt of that. And uh, uh, even oral cultures, the cultural memory is preserved in poetry. That's what's held on to, right? It's, it's a poem that will be, because it has verse and it has uh, certain devices and uh, features that are, are uh, amenable to uh, uh, oral uh, accounting. So he says that, but he says that in the Judea Judeo-Christian tradition, there's a special justification. He, he talks about David's Psalms, and he, he argues that these are divine poems, like, and, and that they allow one, quote, to see God coming in his majesty. And he, sa he argues that David uh, showeth himself a passionate lover of that unspeakable and everlasting beauty to be seen by the eyes of the mind, only cleared by faith. So he makes that argument right, right there at the outset. Um, and um, so that's, that's, that's his first point, is that it seems to be uh, of high value even in ancient cultures. It's, a, it's of high value. How come? Even in a theological age like that of David, it's of high value. David is, is writing poetry and it is being used by uh, and sung in the temple. It's the praises of God's people that it has a special value. It's not that the rest of the, the Bible is of no account, but these poems are being recited and repeated and used for worship. So there's value in it and that seems to transcend culture. So there's something about poetry that is special. That's just one point of his argument. Uh, the second, and he will go on here, is that um, the poet word, the word poet or maker is used um, in many languages. 
I'll come back to some of this, but he, he says that Uh, where is the section in your notes here? But there, he notes that the word poet is the same word poesis in, in Greek, or making, and the poet is, is a maker. And that's, there's a, that sense is there in multiple languages, that the poet is not just a writer, but a maker. And when he says that, he goes to Genesis and talks about the fact that when God makes man in his own likeness and breathes into his image bearer, um, something important is going on there. The divine maker is passing something of his nature into the maker, as in Adam. So Adam bears that creative nature. It, you can't confuse him with a, with a romantic poet on here. He's not talking about uh, a divine being. But something of that uh, God's own capacity is being bestowed to the creature. That's, that's his argument. And uh, he will say that in particular, uh, um, it has, uh, it, that there are two, prob two issues with that. Uh, firstly, um, Adam bears that image and carries that capacity of being a maker, but on the other hand, he falls. which means that the uh, effect of, the, of, the, um, of mankind's poetry is tinged by sin. On the other hand, uh, we also have the second Adam, the recapitulation. There's a second Adam, a second head. We had one head being Adam. We inherited his sin, his sin nature. On the other hand, we have a second head, Christ. We also have, if we are in Christ, have his nature. And, and can use his mind, the mind of, let the mind of Christ be in you. That image, that mindset, that divine capacity uh, allows for the creation of imagery. So he, to use his phrase, um, with Christ's mind, we uh, know what perfection is. With Christ's mind, we know what a perfection is. On the other hand, because of the continuing effects of sin, we know that we never attain that in our own writing. And so what he is doing with this is suggesting that poetry, while it is pointing to the ideal and gives us a picture of what the ideal is, is nonetheless it falls short of it. But that doesn't mean it's of no use. It is of some use, but it's not, it's not divine poetry, which the Romantics will mistake. So we come to the Romantics in about a month or less, and the Romantics will talk about their, their creation in a um, sense of almost primal creative power, creation ex nihilo almost. Uh, Sidney never talks about that here. Um, so there is a, uh, it has a divine origin, and yet it, um, it invariably falls short of a divine status. But that doesn't mean it has nothing there. Uh, comments or questions at this point? I'm just giving a summary here. I could go through it in bit by bit. I'm skipping over his um, beginning and describing the horse and the ideal horse and so forth. He seems to be hearkening back to Horace and that. But that, that seems to me uh, one of the important clear emphasis here this idea of being a maker and, a, and bearing God's image and at the same time and realizing that within the mind of the second Adam, Christ, and his teaching, there's something genuinely creative and true being stated. And yet, although we bear the mind of Christ, because we're influenced by the first Adam, our creations fall short of that. So those things seem to me clear in his uh, treatment there. So on the Psalms and so forth, you, you will see on page 256 here, he talks about um, 
um, and his uncertainty of whether they're written in meter or so forth. But there's nonetheless a, they're there and they ought not to be. And the last line there, 256, he says, but they that with quiet judgments will look a little deeper into it shall find the end and working of it such as being rightly applied deserveth not to be scourged out of the church of God. In other words, poetry deserves to be maintained. It's a pretty negative and weak argument, but it doesn't deserve to be scourged out because God himself ordains poetry in the Old Testament. And he could amplify it by talking about the, uh, its use in the New Testament. There are clear poetic passages there. Um, the section on calling him a poet is at the top of 257 there from this verb poying. Poying. Which is just to make. And there's a maker. And that we use that word very carefully of God, but it, we also describe poets that way. And in every language, it's, he's ever been considered a maker of some sort. So those things are, are there. Um, and then he'll draw on Aristotle and, uh, and Horace. And he will define, and this is where it gets interesting, I think. He talks about uh, Aristotle and his use of mimesis. And I've talked about this word before already. I'm going to spend some time on that here. Because this is Aristotle's term. And remember, it means representation or imitation, however you prefer. Uh, mimesis is one of the things that a, a poet does. And that count that uh, represents or counterfeits or for, figures forth. Counterfeit sounds fraudulent in our day, but it's a, a, uh, another making, a counterfactual. Um, and, it's a, and the word that's often used uh, as the artistic ideal is it ut pictura poesis. Like, make like a picture. Make like a picture. A visual image. So when Shakespeare writes, you have an image in your mind. And you, you can see in images, and we talked in one class about the fact that some people visualize in images, but not all people do, but words do do that. Even if you're not inclined to think visually, the language pushes you to think visually. And that's what uh, good mimesis does. It makes you think in images. And uh, so that's the first thing. It, it, it's a speaking picture. And the purpose of the speaking picture, and he says it very clearly, is to teach and to delight. In that, he agrees with Horace. It has an instructive element, teaching. It also has a joyful element. If you want, the goodness and the truth are here, and the beauty is here, although there's a delight in goodness as well. <laughs> but that twofold thing, there, the, a good poet does always teach and delight, and the speaking pictures that are created by the poets teach and delight. And most people, when they read literature, that's, they are delighting in it. They're being entertained. But they're being more than entertained in the best stories. They're also being instructed and, and taught. Um, but there are three kinds of mimesis. And let me, this is where I said I want to expand on this a little bit. Three kinds. <coughs> one are the ones that, the one he mentioned already, the, that of David. What does David do? He imitates the inconceivable excellencies of God. He's writing a poem, but he's writing a poem about God. It's clearly in poetry. It's clearly the word of God. Yes, but it's the word of God through the conduit of David, David writing poetic psalms, putting it to music. And that type of mimesis is, speaking of the object, is a, it's about God. It's a very special type of poetry and has a special standing. So however much I like Milton, 
we don't sing Milton's verse in churches. Sometimes I have, at, at, so the Nativity Ode I've actually read at a, uh, uh, in a church one point, just the introduction to it, um, and it seemed to me fitting, but we wouldn't sing that per se. Uh, whereas, whereas David's psalms will regularly be sung in churches without any concern because it's, it's, it's reflecting on the excellences of God. So that's that, there's that type of mimesis. The second is a broader category, and these will range from uh, what he calls moral or natural or ast astronomical or even historical subject matter. That's the subject of poetry there, and that's the broad range uh, under that. And it qualifies as poetry. Now, this is an interesting point, not because of the proposed subject. That, so it's not because the poet proposes it, but rather because the subject matter uh, is, he uses the word invention. It, it, it pre-exists. It's a, what Augustine talked about as the nature of nature. That wasn't his phrase, but the gist of it. So it's been invented. It's been, it's been brought in. It's not the, a, a subject matter proposed by the poet. It's rather, it's the nature of things that proposes themselves to the poet. Those are poetic then as well. So it's not just what Coleridge will call the fancy. Whatever I propose to do, decide is poetic matter, that's what I'm gonna write about. Rather, it's of the imagination. I'm using Coleridge's vocabulary here, but it's things that were true, have always been true, and always will be true. And the, the poet perceives those and, and writes them down. And those relate to all of those subjects, whether it's, it's moral teaching or describing the natural world or the world of the heavens or uh, of historical subject matter. There's something that is of truth in all of that. That he regards also as the subject of mimesis or representation of making like a picture, vis giving a visual image or a speaking picture. That's also worthy of mimesis. And then the third type is a little bit more complicated still. And this is the most important of the three. Um, and it has Aristotle's in mind here. Remember what Aristotle said. Arist Aristotle says that it's in human nature to love, to imitate. It's almost a definition. He sees it as in human nature, we love imitation. Is he talking about the way children like to imitate adults? Is, it, is he talking about how people like to go to the theater? It's not clear, it could be both. It's, it's a very general statement being made there, and it, may be, it, it, it probably is both. There's a general desire to like to mimic things and to see the mimicry. And we were talking about boxing and so forth. Why do we delight in that? Because there is a, it represents a struggle that we sense in our lives. That's sort of an existential struggle. There's a struggle against an opponent. The opponent wants to knock us down. And we can see that portrayed in the boxing ring. There's a fight going on. There's one guy and there's another guy and they're trying to knock each other out. But you may be on one side, you may not be. You may still enjoy it just because you sense there's a struggle in that is true of your life, that sort of struggle. But that representation is going on there. I think that's, that's part of what Aristotle's talking about there. And it, in particular, it fits in the tragedy. He says that it's particularly poignant there, but it's true of art in general. But he says that the, the poet imitates things that were in the past or are now, or that people say and think to be, uh, or those things that ought to be. So it could be something relating to all of those things. Because uh, Aristotle says it could be something that happened, it could be historical, it could be relating to the way things are now, or it could even be talking about not the future, but the, but the way things ought to be in the future. So there's an idealization there. And that, that's the third element uh, in particular, the way things ought to be. That's where I think uh, Sidney is going to say poetry is, why do we need Christian poetry? Because Christian poetry presents things the way they ought to be. They aren't that way now, they weren't that way in the past, but they could be that way in the future. And there's, so there's a moral imperative to the poetry, which we will see in, I would say, Lewis and Tolkien's work. 
there's a yearning for things the way they ought to be in light of the way they are. It doesn't need to remain that way. It ought to be otherwise. And you can do that in fiction so long as it's wedded to uh, God's truth. So that, that would be the justification for it. And this is why I think people perceive Tolkien and Lewis uh, and writers like them, and they're not, it's not only them, Dorothy Sayers and many others, to be um, invaluable in their own um, walk of discipleship. I don't want to do without those stories. I want to read them again. I find them encouraging. I will cite them in sermons. Say, I, I've heard pastors cite Narnia in sermons and Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. How come? Like, why not cite scripture? Is God's word not sufficient? <clears throat> That's the, like, I liked your illustration there. It was very moving, but why didn't you stick with the Bible? Right? Because like you're, you're pulling on a lesser authority there when you could have made a higher appeal. Like, why deal with a lower court of appeal than you go to the Supreme Court and let the counsels of God speak? Well, because poetry has a, a vision of the way things ought to be and it presents it very well in, in visual imagery. I think that's it. Um, so, and... Um, David Lyle Jeffrey and my friend Greg Maia, actually both of them, uh, talk about this in their work uh, on Christianity and literature. It's a good volume, by the way. Uh, nice green book, but it's uh, helpful. Uh, they talk about uh, the poetics of conversion. This is what they, the term they use to describe what uh, Sidney's talking about. It's the poetics of conversion. Uh, our, our, our wills might be infected but our wits are erected. They have been, through what right reason, we see the way things ought to be. And then the poetics will fit what our minds realize ought to be the truth, and yet the world doesn't meet that. So how does that get represented? Well, through a poetics of conversion. It's an idealization. And so some have seen Sidney as a, pl a Platonist because he's idealizing, right? When Plato talks about in his uh, Republic about, about the way things ought to be in his ideal Republic. He's really writing like a poet. So he's criticizing the poets, but the reason he's doing it is because they lie, but he's still using a poetic depiction of the way things ought to be to appeal to his readers. He's not making a philosophical argument. He's making an emotional or even a theological appeal to a greater good sense of justice and of goodness and beauty and truth, and it must underlie, that's a, that's a, a poet's appeal. And most, uh, most poets regard Plato as a poet, even though they acknowledge he's a philosopher, they think that there is something deeply poetic about Plato, including C.S. Lewis, for that matter. Um, and that's why I love, when I, when I read Plato, I think, you can't be serious in your critique of the poets. Like, what are you talking about? You, you're talking about the very thing that the best poets are talking about. That's what you're doing here, man. Come on. Right? So that's why you think you have to recognize the historic grounds of his critique. And again, I note, and I've always said this to my philosopher colleagues just to irk them, that Plato, whenever he wants to make a really good point, he tells a myth. He concludes his dialogues with myths, and, you know, and even in the Republic, he's right, giving us an ideal of the way things ought to be rather than the way they actually are. And they just grind their teeth and whatever. Or they don't just mock and dismiss me, which is fine. I've had worse. Um, but, but that is, there's an ideal to which we should aspire, and that's there in the poet, poetry. And it's rarely there in life. So this is where the, uh, Plato says that poetry is superior to history and also to philosophy. Superior. Philosophy tells us things that are generally true or in abstraction true, but doesn't have anything to move us or inspire us. History tells us what happened. And it's useful for that. And by the way, poets can use all of those things. There can be a philosophical dimension. 
there can be it can be a historically rooted account, like many of Shakespeare's plays, for account, for example. It's based out of, say, Holinshed's Chronicles. I'm doing a Shakespeare class right now. He's rooting it in uh, an account of history, and yet he is doing something with that historical account. He's trying to say something more than the original uh, sources would say, so the way it ought to have been, either for good or for ill. So sometimes I'm doing King Lear right now. In Holinshed's Chronicles, Cordelia marries Edgar, the faithful youngest daughter who everybody loves, who won't uh, get caught up in this hypocrisy at the beginning of the play. She won't do it, and she gets banished for it. And in the end, she is restored, and she marries. And there's a sort of a happy ending there. Well, not in Shakespeare's play. In Shakespeare's play, she's killed, hanged. They can't get there in time. Why does Shakespeare do this? Hmm? I, well, no, I don't think it's quite that simple. Uh, because uh, in general, Shakespeare's fa plays affirm justice and order. They affirm that. And they do that either in a tragedy or in a comedy. In a comedy, they do it by bringing a, about uh, a marriage scene at the end, right? There's all sorts of marriages, and life carries on, and there's a, you know, a, a, this wonderful uh, closure, and it's a happy ending. That's the comedies. In the tragedies, the bad guys are punished. But there's a, the good guys tend not to be, but in, if they are, then they suffer it early on, not at the end in Act 5. In Act 5 of King Lear, the most admirable character of all, Cordelia, who encourages her husband, the King of France, to invade, to protect her father, to save him from her sisters in the Civil War, she gets hanged, she's caught. And after, after, um, it was clear that her side had won. Like the King of France is victorious and she's a prisoner and we better get there before it's too late. Well, it is too late. Why does Shakespeare do that? It, it works totally against his usual uh, mode of conduct or the way he writes things. It doesn't fit the template of order. There's disorder here, that, a brokenness that isn't healed. Isn't there a theory too that he might have done that because one of his children died? Yeah, a son named Hamlet who died. He wrote the play Hamlet. That's the theory. I don't know about Cordelia here, but I think it's dealing with the sense of loss in life and not being able to explain it and doesn't fit into the categories of order uh, placed on the stage. He can affirm goodness and order and hierarchy and so forth. But guess what? Sometimes tragedy happens and it can't be, the poets can't explain it away. So I don't think it contradicts what, what Sidney is saying here. I think in some ways the, the exception proves the rule, but the exception is acknowledging the reality of life that sometimes actually, even in a good poet's good affirmation of order, people are damaged and they never recover. Sometimes the bad guys lose. Nazi, you don't see that a lot in Renaissance poetry or, or Renaissance theater. You see it more in the 20th century, much more. And why is that? Good question. It's and the strength of evil and the sense that um, even on the side of the good, there's so much hurt that's happened in the atrocities of the war and so many dead that uh, we can't be satisfied with the poetic depiction of an ideal being achieved. There's too much, like in the Civil War, the American Civil War, I think the, the uh, damage goes to this day, colors the politics of the country. You can't get past it. It's not just partisan, two sides trying to win an election. There's, a, there's something deeper there. It's a, a hurt that doesn't, doesn't get healed. 
I think that's, that's part of American politics. It's like, what, civil war? That was back in the 19th century. Both sides deplore it. How come it carries on? Because it was a civil war and it was over a matter of, of human rights and the, the consequences of that socially carry on as well. So it's not just, you can't just get over it. That's, that's what I'm talking about. So that's why King Lear is maybe his most compelling play in some ways. It has that element which is, doesn't, it's not quite so neat. There are other plays there that are, are of a similar sort, but that one particularly so. So uh, he, he presents though that the poet can present what may be and should be. There is an idealization and poetry does this in a way that philosophy can't and a, in a way that history certainly can't because history never presents the way it ought to have been. They present it as it was. That's what history does. Otherwise they move into propaganda, fictions about the past. You know, like the American founding fathers or the English Civil War or the Canada's Confederation. There's a, an element of history and there's also an element of myth making going on there. Idealization. That's the poetic side of writing history. Good history does that actually. Um, and at that point though, they're not just doing fiction, they're trying to teach moral lessons. That's the point. Like there's something uh, that was good in the foundation that we ought to hold on to because it's part of our identity. That's the case that's being made and that will guide you in current troubles. So those are all poetic appeals, and, and even historians will write those. So uh, Sidney then, uh, put it briefly there, um, argues that, that poetry has that Id idealistic quality, that moral uh, dimension which allows him to write as a Christian, because again, in in Christian eschatology, Christ has come into the world, has uh, put an end to sin for his people. He's, he's put death to death by rising from the dead. And yet we live between the time of his first coming and his second coming. And even though that kingdom, which is in the eschatology, which is breaking in upon us all around us through the kingdom of God or merging up around us, it's still a world marked by sin. And yet you can idealize the time when that will no longer be the case. And po poetry does that. And it's right that it does that. And it's based on those things that I just discussed. Comments or questions about this? I'm almost giving you an overview rather than going through it bit by bit. Every time I teach this, I do it differently. So I'll, no, hearing nothing, um, I will so on page 257, he says, only the poet, this is two thirds of the way down, disdaining to be tied to any such subjection, lifted up with the vigor of his own invention, doth grow in effect into another nature in making things either better than nature bringeth forth or quite anew forms such as never were in nature as the heroes, demigods, cyclops, Shimmeras, Furies, and such like. Now, if you read Tolkien on this, Tolkien thought that these ex beings did exist and even invents them in the past. He creates beings in the past and says that they really existed. Uh, Sidney thinks not. He thinks that these are poetic, poetic inventions. And they're poetic inventions, however, that he's probably going to admit are pretty universal. There seem to be dragons all over the place, and there's, which represents an evil beast, and it's a beast that you can't bargain with furthermore, and you can't defeat. That seems to be pretty universal in literature. I know Jordan Peterson talks about that a lot in his writing, and, and that's a big part of um, uh, archetypal thinking, that there are certain um, ur builds or images, original myths that are there in all these other myths. 
Sydney is more skeptical of them. They didn't really exist. And yet, um, he says that uh, it's, the poet is uh, validated in creating them. There's nothing wrong with that in the sense that he's describing forces and powers that transcend human powers. There's a supernatural power that uh, even scripture acknowledges. So our enemies are not flesh and blood. Right? So now they're being depicted. Maybe there's always a sense, even in the pagan authors, that our, their enemies weren't the only the people that they were shooting arrows at or fighting with spears. or right? that There's something more here, and it's not just the natural forces. There's a, something behind that. We are, there's a war going on here, and that's being depicted poetically. That's Sidney's sense. So they're, they're making this up, and yet we will grant them the existence of such beings, even though we don't think they ever were such beings. So did, did Homer really think that there was a cyclops? Who knows? And the Lastragonians, the giants that eat men, and the, uh, the Scylla and Charybdis, these beings with the heads that grab men and bite them and swallow them down. Did he really think that these actually existed? Or are they depictions of natural forces that have been given a supernatural a sort of a personhood and the furies in the underworld are these actual beings did they really think that they were or were they metaphors for something else if you read um, Robert Graves Greek mythology he, he, he has a theory for the Greek myths by the way it's a really good book if you're interested in uh, Greek mythology, Robert Graves Greek mythology, two volumes or one big one, uh, talks about all of the Greek myths that he can, and he gathers them up and tries to give some sort of an explanation for them, and the harmonizing of various threads of different myths because they sometimes pop up and have different, like the myth of Prometheus, has different stories there, and some emerge later, and uh, than others, and they get more significance. Uh, but he would explain a lot of these myths in accordance with natural forces. So the Scylla and the Charybdis. So the Scylla is what? A beast that eats men, whereas Charybdis is like a, a tidal pool. It's a whirlpool, and it sucks me. Are you better off going near the beast that's going to eat you? Or are you better going towards the waterfall? Well, if you go around the tidal pool, then everyone's going to die. So you're better off going by the Sela because the Sela is only going to be, because it's got six heads, it's going to eat six men at a time. And if you row fast, you're only going to lose six, like Odysseus does. Okay, well, we'll go a little closer, but it's a pretty awful choice. My men are going to die. But are we all going to die or some? Okay, I take that path. Is there a moral teaching there? Can we save everyone? No. So what ought we to do? So is that, but he would, he would say that, that it's a natural choice. It's describing natural forces. And uh, that's often the rationalistic explanation. Sometimes it get, it's given a psychological reading. That's what Jordan Peterson does. That's what Carl Jung did. He gave a psychological reading of all of these myths. And, and that's common in the discipline of psychology. So Freud, the Oedipus complex, the Electra complex, he's, he's not talking about the story of Oedipus. He's saying it, that reflects primal human desires and taboos. So it's, he's saying there's something, something to it here, but it's, a, it's a, something about the darkness of the human heart that we read in that story. I don't think that that ever occurred to Sophocles or Aristotle. That's his reading on it, and he explains everything psychologically. Um, note how Sidney doesn't do that. He doesn't psychologize those creatures. Uh, he doesn't, you hemorrhize them, which is to say that they are representation of ancient kings and their opponents and so forth. So there's an ancient king, and we so Achilles actually represents an ancient king here, and his opponent represents his opponents, and sort of the monsters, those are 
the foes that he defeated there and they get passed on and at, over time they become mythologized. There is a, a historical event and it gets mythologized. And so now we call it Achilles, but originally it was some other king. But all of them are dealing with the problem of myths. What do we do with these myths? Because we think there's something there. And the reason we tell the stories about the old kings, even in the, in the euhemerization of it, is there's something that remains universally significant in the myths. That's why we keep holding on to them. But no, they're all different accounts for it. Sidney doesn't do any of that. He says, these are forms such as never were in nature. And yet the poet is warranted in this. And so as he goeth hand in hand with nature, not enclosed within the narrow warrant of uh, her gifts, but freely ranging only within the zodiac of his own wit, nature never set forth the earth in so rich tapestry as diverse poets have done neither with so pleasant rivers, fruitful trees, sweet-smelling flowers, nor whatsoever else may make the too much love earth more lovely. Her world is brazen. The poets only deliver a golden. So in that sense, it is the cultural mandate, which is to be fruitful and multiply and fill and subdue the earth. That's what the poetry is doing. It's making the good nature and even the bad nature better, imaginatively. He sees this as legitimate, so long as it accords with um, the second Adam. So it's not, um, it's not uh, blind, just made up stuff. That's not, that, there's, there's more to it than that. There's an idealization that's going on. Uh, but back to history and philosophy, he says that uh, with respect to history, it teaches by precept. No, philosophy teaches by precept. And history teaches by example. But since philosophy doesn't have examples, and history doesn't have precepts, they need a type of writing that has both, and that's poetry. So the best histories lay, lean upon poetry, like Plato. And the best, did I say histories? I meant philosophies. The best philosophies, like Plato, lean upon poetry to make their points. Same with the best histories. Herodotus, Thucydides, the speeches that are being made. He's not recording the speeches. He wasn't there. He's, he's making up the speeches, and the speeches are brilliant. They're better than would have been uttered by the man at the time. Because they're in the moment. They don't have time to record their lines and speak in the grand tones and with the flourishes, the rhetorical flourishes. They're not writing that. When, when Homer's writing his accounts of the, of the, uh, in the Iliad book 9, and there are men who have come to try and persuade uh, Achilles that he should come come into the battle they're given great speeches they come in and they give them and they're fantastic speeches and then Achilles having heard all three gives back a better speech than the three that came to him I mean the great stuff look at the Iliad book 9 as a manual for rhetoric it's terrific stuff he's not recording speech that's not he, he wasn't an eyewitness anyway he wasn't there to record it and nobody else was. So they didn't have a recording device and click, now it's on. Oh, I got to get that. And what did you say again? Could you repeat that? It's none of that. The poet has made that, those speeches up. But they represent the character of the speakers. And the audience then understands who these types of men are and the types of speech that they use. And they appreciate the power of that type of speaking. And then they model that type of speaking in their own discourse. And then Achilles' response to it is even more powerful. By the way, one of the speakers that comes to persuade Achilles is Odysseus. And he says of Odysseus, he despises the man who holds one thing in his heart and yet speaks another. In other words, he despises the fraud. Two heroes, Achilles, Odysseus, two epics. What does Achilles think of Odysseus? He's a deceiver. Achilles will have none of that. That's not Achilles. That's not his type of man. Get out of my sight. <laughs> See, 
I know you, and he admires him, but he knows that he, he is using deceit in order to get him back in the battle, and he's not going to have it. Not a man like him. As much as he admires him in one way, he's not the sort of straight, just give it to me, straight, that's what I want. And that's not because Achilles is a, is a numbskull. It's because he's a virtuous man. He won't fight, but he's not going to be tricked. Uh, so there's an ethical value to poetry. I say the one uses precepts, philosophy. The other uses examples, history. Poetry is able to combine the virtues of both. So it includes both of them. So the best. I, I think English, philosophy, history are three components of every liberal arts degree here at Tyndale. Uh, English has what the two others offer, and then some. That should get back. That's on the internet, so it'll get back anyway. Anyway, they think themselves, they, they would say the same thing for their own discipline, so I have no particular problem with that. So uh, he says, oh, that's, I like that. That was good. <laughs> Best ring tome ever. Okay. And he says that um, whereas the, his, uh, so the philosopher's thought is too abstract in general to be applied by most people, and that's true. So talk about the use to the church. Apologetics appeals to the head. How many people are moved by apologetics arguments? Something like, 15% of the population, so I understand. I wish it were more, quite frankly, because I value it, and it's the most important ground, by the way, that the rational argument, absolutely vital, the most important one there. But in terms of uh, an actual defense that will be persuasive to most people, that doesn't work, a philosophical defense doesn't get you anywhere. I've seen uh, apologists win debates, and the audience is, uh -uh. And they clearly won it. If you follow the arguments, the, the, the Christian apologist trounces them. And yet their opponents, everybody's with their opponents. How can that be? It's appalling. But that's, it's because of the nature of the argument being offered. It's a philosophical defense. Um, he says, so it's too abstract and general to be applied by most people, whereas the historian is so tied not to what should be, but to what is, that his example draweth no necessary consequences. So yeah, that was true of Sir Winston Churchill, and that was true there, but it was so tied to his particular context. He's fighting Na Nazi Germany, right? And the America, like, so there's the context. Is that our context? Well, the context is different, so the example doesn't apply. But he says, so it, it draws no necessary consequences and is therefore a less fruitful doctrine by contrast now doth the peerless poet perform both. For whatsoever the philosopher saith should be done, he giveth a perfect picture of it in someone by whom he presupposeth, presupposeth it was done, so as he coupleth the general notion with the particular example. So there you go. And uh, that's what a poet can do. And so he can depart from the source. He can even put it in the mouth of an original, like a real historical figure, and yet the speech seems to be more, probably more uh, philosophical and profound than Napoleon might have given, or Winston Churchill might have given. And he, he does uh, certainly uh, give way to hyperbole here. He's over, over egging the pudding, overstating the case, but only a little bit. I think this is generally true. Um, but that mimesis that I talked about is uh, there from 258 down at the bottom and onward. Uh, I will recapitulate what I said earlier there. He says, uh, neither let it be deemed too saucy a comparison to balance the highest point of man's wit with the efficacy of nature, but rather Give right honor to the heavenly maker of that maker who, having made man to his own likeness, set him beyond and over all the works of that second nature. 
which in nothing he showeth so much as in poetry, when with the force of a divine breath he bringeth forth things uh, surpassing her doings, with no small arguments to the incredulous of that first accursed fall of Adam, since our erected uh, wit maketh us know what perfection is, and yet our infected will keepeth us from reaching unto it. But these arguments will be few, will, will by few be understood, and by fewer granted. Thus much, I hope, will be given to me, that the Greeks, with some probability of reason, give him the name above all names of learning, the poet. Why is Homer regarded as the preeminent? How come? The philosophers felt the need to assail Homer. How come? Why did he remain in their esteem ever after, despite the philosophers? How come? Because for all of the arguments that Plato makes and Aristotle's contributions in the philosophical schools, they still cite Homer. How come? It's not because the arguments against them weren't valid. There were valid points being made. But still, there wasn't sufficient there because there was a value in the poets', the poets uh, arsenal of images, speaking pictures that people thought were, uh, they could not dispense with. So much so that the, the second greatest philosopher, Aristotle, thought that his teacher, Plato, was flat wrong. Right? See, the, even the philosophers don't agree on this point. They have to give way and recognize that poetry has a power and a need. And in fact, Aristotle even says that the subject matter of poetry is the same as philosophy, the way things ought to be. He actually says that. He's not denying that the gods are misrepresented, but in general, poetry does this. It's, it's, it's the way things ought to be. So poesy, therefore, so let us go on to a more ordinary opening of him, that the truth may be the more palpable. And so I hope, though we, got, we get not so unmatched a praise as the etymology of his names will grant, yet his very description, by which no man will deny, shall not justly be barred from a principal commendation. Poesy, therefore, is an art of imitation. For so Aristotle termeth it in the word mimesis, that is to say, a representing, counterfeiting or figuring forth to speak metaphorically a speaking picture. This phrase, as I say, which he gets directly from Horace. A speaking picture with this end, to teach and delight. And Augustine referred to that as well. Right? In On Christian Doctrine, he explicitly referred to teach and to delight. He added one more, though, to move. And that, I think, is an important thing, because remember, in Augustine's teaching, the purpose of all of the signs and, and, and things, the race and signa, is to move us towards where we ought to be, and where we ought to be is to delight in God. So the signs and the reading and these works are all moving us in that direction, and so ought uh, poetry to do. But no, he doesn't cite the moving here, just the teaching and the delighting. And then he goes through the three types that I talked about earlier on. Those that are the inconceivable excellencies of God, one. Um, the second, the matter is philosophical or moral or historical or astronomical. And then the third, um, which I said I was going to skip over, so I will skip over. But those, but the, the second there uh, are the, the uh, matters of this world. So he talks about this there. Uh, I'll give the Latin reading here. Um, I am testis temporum lux veritatis vita memoriae magistra vitae nuntia vetustatis. So it is... Uh, the witness of passing ages, the light of truth, the life of memory, the mistress of life, 
she who brings tidings of antiquity. That's from, from Cicero. Any man of teaching, teaching of virtue and virtuous actions is comparable to him. The philosopher, saith he, that is Cicero, teaches a disputative virtue, but I do an active. So it's not just a theoretical virtue that's arguing with an opponent, it is an active virtue that is uh, being embodied by a character that we want to uh, follow his example. The great Bilbo Baggins, or Frodo. A moral example. His virtue, that is the philosopher's, is excellent in the dangerless academy of Plato, but mine showeth forth her honorable face in the battles of Marathon, Pharsalia, Poitiers, and Agincourt. He teacheth virtue by certain abstract considerations, but I only bid you follow the footing of them that have gone before you. Old aged experience goeth beyond the fine-witted philosopher, but I give the experience of many ages. Lastly, if he make the songbook, I put the learner's hand to the lute. And if he be the guide, I am the light. Then would be, he allege you innumerable examples confirming story by stories. How much the wisest senators and princes have been directed by the credit of history as Brutus, and Alphonsus of Aragon, and who not be, and who not if need be. At length, the long line of their disputation make the point in this, that the one giveth the precept, the other the example. This is the historian and the philosopher arguing amongst themselves. Now, whom shall we find to be the moderator? This is the poet. Truly, as seemeth me, seemeth the poet. So the philosophers can talk till they're blue in the face about the way things ought to be. Let me tell you what really moved things. That was men in history. That's what I deal with. And there are, there's an argument between the two and it is irresolvable because they don't acknowledge the legitimacy of their various appeals. So philosophers go crazy with the historians. And likewise, historians go, facts, give me the facts. You know, you, you're, you can't deal with the generalities. Give me the particulars, what actually happened? Yeah, we can, we can deal with that later and the historians never come to the later, there's never a, they never come to the later. There's never a, how do we assess the history now? Right, but the poet does do this. Truly as me seemeth the poet, and if not a moderator, even the man that ought to carry the title from them both, and much more from all other serving sciences. How do you like that? Therefore, compare we the poet with the historian and with the moral philosopher. And if he go beyond them both, no other human skill can match him. For as for the divine, that is like the clergyman, with all reverence it is ever to be accepted, not only for having his scope as far beyond any of these as eternity exceeded a, a moment, but even for passing each of these in themselves. And for the lawyer, though use, just, justice, or the law, uh, I think it's law here, the law, yeah, of course it's the law, the law in Latin, although the law be the daughter of justice, and justice the chief of virtues, yet because he seeketh to make men good rather than formidine pene, or virtuous amore, so the uh, move from the fear of punishment by the love of virtue, where they're moved by um, Make ma making men good by the love of virtue rather than the fear of punishment, or to say writer doth both endeavor to make men good, but that their evil hurt not others, having no care, so he be a good citizen. How bad a man he be, therefore as our wickedness make him necessary, and necessity maketh him honorable, so is he not in the deepest truth to stand in rank with these who all endeavor to take naughtiness away and plant goodness even in the secret cabinet of our souls. Anyway. So to conclude, the philosopher and the historian are they which would win the goal, the one by precept, the other by example, but both, not having both, do both halt. 
For the philosopher setting down with thorny arguments the, bar the bare rule is so hard of utterance and so misty to be conceived that one that hath no other guide but him shall wade in him till he be old before he shall find sufficient cause to be honest. <laughs> so now he's charging the philosophers that the philosophers are like the men in the cave facing the wall. They talk in shadows. They never come to the point. To flipping it. Can't give a concrete example, an application. I would say the same is often true of theology as well. We're talking about the nature of God, the necessity of correct theological belief, but how does that work it out in an, in an example? How, in the application, it's often the application that it, there's a lack of hold on the audience. The best preachers I've ever heard have, have been literary men because they can come up with a really good illustration. The, and the illustration, it doesn't go beyond the theological point. It illustrates exactly what the theological point was. And everyone goes, yeah, that's it. And now I've, I've got it and I, that comes away. But until they make that application, which is the poetic aspect, it doesn't really land. Maybe that's just me because I respond to that. I don't know. But that's, that's how it seems to me. But he says, for, in hi for his knowledge, that is the philosopher, standeth so upon the abstract in general, that happy is that man who may understand him, and more happy that can apply what he doth understand. On the other side, the historian, wanting the precept, is so tied not to what should be, but to what is, to the particular truth of things and not to the general reason of things, that his example draweth no necessary consequence, and therefore a less fruitful doctrine. Now doth the peerless poet perform both. For whatsoever the philosopher saith should be done, he giveth a perfect picture of it in someone by whom he presupposeth, presupposeth it was done. So it doesn't have to be somebody, it could be somebody he imagines or a poet has created. A perfect picture, I say, for he yieldeth to the powers of the mind an image of that whereof the philosopher bestoweth but a wordish description, only is just a wordish description, which doth neither strike, pierce, nor possess the sight of the soul so much as the other doth. So it's not enough to use the language of logic or a metaphysical appeal. You have to give an image that appeals to the listener. And at that point, it moves. And philosophers don't do that, but poets do. It's not that philosophers can't do it. The best philosophers do do it, as I say. And uh, my colleague Rick, Rich Davis agrees with me on that, that this is why C.S. Lewis is such a good philosopher. The philo philosophy is good, and then he gives you a wonderful story that actually illustrates the philosophical point. He is actually writing like a good philosopher. He is. Anyway, I realize I overshot the time. Pardon me, I got carried away. Um, 